If you want to support the channel, then please check out my Patreon page to gain access to exclusive videos, take part in Q&As, and watch my retrospectives before they go live on YouTube. A king has his reign, and then he dies. It's inevitable. These are images of archaeological digs from all over the earth. These are ancient civilizations that were separated by centuries. They shared no contact with one another, and yet. The same pictogram showing men worshipping giant beings pointing to the stars was discovered at every last one of them. And based on our long-range scans, there seemed to be a planet. And we arrived there this morning. So you're saying we're here because of a map? Not a map, an invitation. From whom? We call them engineers. Tell us what they engineered. They engineered us. Right there, God does not build in straight lines. Starboard side, this valley. Captain, do you think you could put us down there? Yeah, it wouldn't be any good if I couldn't do that, Mr. Ravel. But I'm fairly certain your engineers are nothing but scribblings of savages living in dirty little caves. But let's say I'm wrong. And you do find these beings down there. You won't engage them. You won't talk to them. You will do nothing but report back to me. Hey, Jackson. What's that for? Expedition security. My job's to make sure everybody's nice and safe. This is a scientific expedition. No weapons. All right, then. Good luck with that. What is your position? Whatever that probe is picking up, it's reading life for him. Prometheus, come in. Is anyone there? You know what this place is? Those, uh, engineers? This ain't their home. It's fairly evident. They were in the process of leaving. Leaving to go where? Earth. Why? Sometimes to create, one must first destroy. They aren't what we thought they were. I was wrong. We were so wrong. We must leave. Big things have small beginnings. In early June of 2012, Prometheus exploded onto the big screen throughout the world, with director Ridley Scott back behind the camera to explore the origins of the alien. Produced for a large budget of around $130 million, the film was met with mixed reviews at the time, but generated over $400 million worldwide, thanks in part to the 3D presentation, as it came out during the 3D boom, with cinemas charging you nearly double to watch the film with silly glasses on. Prometheus came with a strong marketing campaign with videos focused on the Android David and Wayland Industries, with a TED talk with a young Peter Wayland and additional material covering the crew of the Prometheus. Fans were really excited to see that Ridley Scott had returned to the sci-fi genre, and the trailers showed something really epic, but there were mixed messages about what the film was about. The filmmakers were saying this isn't a direct prequel to Alien, but set in the same universe, and 20th Century Fox and their marketing were really pushing the angle that it was a prequel. When the reviews rolled in, they were mostly hitting the 3 out of 5 mark, with most highlighting the strong visuals, Michael Fassbender's performance as David, and feeling it was the best Alien film of the series since the 1986 sequel. But many criticised its weak script, including stupid and irritating characters, and it wasn't really scary. Total Film, though, gave it a strong review, awarding it 4 out of 5. The late Roger Ebert gave it a glowing review of 4 stars, saying it was a magnificent sci-fi film, all the more intriguing because it raises questions about the origins of human life and doesn't have any answers. It's in the classic tradition of Golden Age sci-fi, echoing Alien from 1979, but creating a world of its own. But film critic Ian Nathan, who recently wrote a book on Ridley Scott and his career, gave it an underwhelming review of 3 out of 5 for Empire magazine. He was largely disappointed with it, saying it lacked suspense, had threadbare characters and a very poor script, but praised its stunning visuals and Fassbender's performance. When it came to DVD and Blu-ray, it sold very well. 
and as this was during the 3D craze, the epic documentary by Charles de Luzerica, who produced the special features for the Alien Quadrilogy set, was only available for the 3D version, so many fans were unaware or missed out watching it when they picked up the regular DVD or Blu-ray. With the Alien series now in the hands of Disney Studios, there is uncertainty where the series will go. Will they finish off this new trilogy or go with a sequel set in the future focusing on everyone's favourite female action hero, Ellen Ripley, or go with the one option everyone is afraid of, the dreaded remake? There had been talk of a fifth Alien film doing the rounds in the early 2000s. Resurrection made money but was met with largely negative reviews, and Fox wanted to get things back on track. Ridley Scott had shown an interest in returning to the series and wanted to explore the origins of the space jockey that appeared in the first film. He felt the Xenomorph had run its course, and the only way to move forward was to go back to the Alien that crashed on LV-426. The space jockey had been explored in the Alien comics, but not to any great lengths. The early 90s saw the Alien and Predator come together in a series of Versus comics. This in turn spawned toys and video games, proving very popular, especially with younger fans. Fox saw box office potential and wanted to get an Alien vs Predator film off the ground trying to lure James Cameron and Ridley Scott back to the franchise, but they didn't want to go down that road and any prospect of the series going forward with them didn't involve the Predator. Any further discussions with Scott and Cameron came to an end, as Paul W.S. Anderson pitched his idea for an AVP film, which impressed the studio. Fox focused on two Alien vs Predator movies, which made the studio money, but both were critically panned. 20th Century Fox hadn't given up on returning to the Alien series and suggested a reboot of the franchise, but soon decided they would be working on a prequel to Alien. Ridley Scott was intrigued to return to the world of science fiction, and always wanted to find out who the space jockey was that made a small appearance in the original 1979 film. He was surprised in all the sequels no one ever thought to ask that question. His production company Scott Free had started developing ideas around a prequel. Writer John Spates made a trip to Scott Free offices and was asked about his thoughts on the Alien series. He felt they couldn't go forward with a sequel as there wasn't much else left to explore, but going back before the first film was the way to go and they agreed. He was given a chance to pitch his idea for a prequel. John wanted to go back to the starship from the first film and its origins, with the crew visiting LV-426 long before the Nostromo turned up. They would find the remains of many dead engineers and discovered one was still alive. He wrote up a detailed 20-page treatment that explored these engineers who played a part in our creation. Scott said the script was talking about gods and engineers, the engineers of space. And were the aliens designed as a form of biological warfare, or biology that would go in and clean up a planet? Fox and Ridley Scott were impressed and John got to work writing and expanding his treatment into a full script. The title of the screenplay would have a number of changes from Alien Engineers to Alien Genesis. By John's fourth draft, they started getting the crew assembled to start designing the film and scheduling the shoot. Ridley was nervous about returning to the sci-fi genre and the Alien series. Fox would only fund this production if Ridley would direct it. Once he fully signed on as the director, he started exploring his own ideas about the engineers. He was starting to move further away from the Alien and was more interested in the origins of mankind and who created us. Writer Damon Lindelof was brought in to do some rewrites. John Spates was not happy, but had been warned this would happen, as John at that point had not had one of his scripts produced, so he was seen as a risk. Damon was best known for his work on the TV show Lost, which had brought on a lot of controversy, with fans laying blame on him for the show's faults, but he had a successful track record. Lindelof was unaware of what Scott and the producers liked about the existing script, and informed them that he found the general concept appealing, but that the story relied too heavily on elements of the Alien films. Ridley wanted to avoid repeating the other films and agreed with Damon. Lindelof said, If the ending to Prometheus is going to be the room that John Hurt walks into that's full of alien eggs in Alien, there's nothing interesting there, because we know where it's going to end. Good stories you don't know where they're going to end. A true prequel should essentially precede the events of the original film, but be about something entirely different, feature different characters, have an entirely different theme, although it takes place in the same world. Lindelof was hired to rewrite John Spate's original script. Ridley felt Damon gave the script a clear three-act structure. Damon said the other parts of the script were strong enough to survive without the alien hallmarks. He said that the film could instead run parallel to the Alien series and that a sequel would be Prometheus 2 and not Alien. 
Lindelof admitted he didn't write well alone, so Scott and Lindelof worked together to construct the vision Scott wanted, including scaling back the alien symbolism and tropes. Focusing on the big question of who created us, with Scott's story concept being partially inspired by Chariots of the Gods, about the theory of ancient astronauts theorising that life on Earth was created by aliens. For the cast, we have Numi Rapace as Elizabeth Shaw, an archaeologist who believes in God. Ridley cast Numi after seeing her performance in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. He was thoroughly impressed with her acting skills and once he met her, he knew she was right for the part. To help aid her method acting, she developed a complete backstory for Shaw and worked with a dialect coach to achieve a British accent. Numi was a fan of Alien, having seen it when she was six years old. Logan Marshall Green plays as Charlie Holloway. Holloway is also an archaeologist and Shaw's love interest. Whereas Shaw believes in God, Holloway is an atheist and skeptic. He described Holloway as the X Games type scientist. He also said that his character doesn't want to meet his maker, he wants to stand next to his maker. Michael Fassbender plays as David, an android that acts as a ship's butler. He is designed to be indistinguishable from humans and begins to develop his own ego, insecurities, jealousy and envy due to Whalen not limiting him on what he could learn. In developing his character, he would avoid copying the android from Alien, instead studying the replicants from Blade Runner, with a focus on Sean Young's character Rachel, whose vacancy and longing for a soul interested him. Fassbender said David's view on the human crew are somewhat childlike. He is jealous and arrogant because he realises that his knowledge is all-encompassing, and therefore he is superior to the humans. Guy Pearce plays as Peter Wayland, the CEO of Wayland Corporation. Ridley cast Guy after being impressed with his performance in the King's Speech and felt Wayland should speak in the Queen's English, and Guy could easily pull that off. The look of Wayland has changed over the years as Paul W.S. Anderson had Lance Henriksen portray him in AVP, and Wayland's look would define the look of Android Bishop, but that idea was scrapped come Prometheus. There was supposed to be a scene featuring Guy as Wayland when he was younger in the film when David reads his dreams, but they never managed to film it. Guy did wonder why they didn't just hire an older actor instead of applying the makeup to make him look older. He would portray a younger Wayland in the viral marketing and the opening sequence for the sequel. Charlie Saron stars as Medirith Vickers. Vickers is a Wayland Corporation employee and daughter of Peter. Ridley Scott wanted her character to lurk in the background watching the others, but demands that Shaw and Holloway follow her orders. The similarities between the appearance and mannerisms of Vickers and David were intended to raise the possibility that Vickers is an android herself, but it's revealed later on she isn't, but just a cold-hearted woman waiting to take over her father's company. Other cast members include Sean Harris as Fifield, who is a geologist. We have Rage Spall as Milburn, a biologist. Idris Elba plays as Janek, the captain of the Prometheus. Kate Dickey as the ship's medic. Eamon Elliott and Benedict Wong as the ship's co-pilots and Patrick Wilson as Shaw's father who appears in a dream sequence which will give you a headache with the eye straining effect they've added to the footage. And finally we have Ian White as the last engineer. Ian was no stranger to the franchise being part of the AVP series playing the hero predator in AVP 1 and 2. Principal photography began in March 2011 and lasted for 82 days. The majority of filming took place at Shepparton and Pinewood Studios in England. The exterior shots of the alien world would be shot in Iceland, at the base of an active volcano in the south of the country. Ridley Scott was convinced by a cinematographer that it would be possible to film in 3D, with the same ease and efficiency of 2D filming. The decision to film in 3D with the red Epic cameras with additional rigs added $10 million to the film's budget. Since 3D films need high lighting levels on set, the dark atmosphere and strong levels of black would be added in production during the colour grading process, though shooting in digital gave the film a more clean and sharper look, instead of the organic soft look of 35mm. Ridley Scott in his usual fashion would storyboard a lot of the movie, sketching out ideas and camera shots very quickly, totally confident in what he wanted. When designing the engineers, Scott wanted the engineers to resemble Roman gods, referencing the Statue of Liberty and Michelangelo's David, for example. The eight-foot-tall humanoid space jockeys were created by applying bulky full-body prosthetics to the actors, whose facial features were diminished by the material, and were later digitally enhanced to preserve their godlike physical perfection. Scott described the engineers as tall, elegant, dark angels. The elephant-style facial features were no longer part of the engineers' physical makeup but would serve as protective armour for space travel. The artists involved at first hated the idea that the space jockey was more human in design, and the engineer's suit was just this organic armour to drive the ship, but they appreciated Ridley's way of taking what you know and turning it on its head, being unpredictable. 
Ridley Scott wanted to work with H.R. Giger again and wanted his input in the process to help design new creatures for the film. He provided a few sketches that were ultimately not used in the end. Giger was surprised how fast they were moving forward and they were going in a different direction, but he was pleased they still used his original concepts for the building blocks of this new film. They did however use some of his classic designs in the mural paintings. You can see his influence on other parts of the film, especially his earlier work on the cancelled Dune movie from the 70s for the engineer's facility. Ridley said he was filming Prometheus with both adult oriented R and more accessible PG-13 film ratings in mind, allowing the more adult content to be cut if necessary without harming the overall presentation. With the large budget, he was aware he would have to present Fox with a PG-13 version, so a wider audience could see it. As it is a money-making business, they want to maximise their profits. Luckily, Scott would not be forced to compromise the film's quality to avoid an R rating, and it would be released without any cuts being made. But a number of interesting scenes were removed, totalling about 30 minutes that would end up as deleted scenes on the Blu-ray. The opening scene had more engineers on what could appear to be Earth, a lengthier discussion between Vickers and her father. The mutated design of Fifield appeared more like the traditional alien but was redesigned for the theatrical cut. There is more dialogue between Wayland and the engineer, but the biggest change came with Shaw going up against the engineer which they trimmed down. You can see the engineer observing their technology and Shaw attacks him with an axe. It ends up being far more exciting and intense. Scott felt Shaw directly wounding him diminished his role apparently. As Fox started to press forward with marketing the film, the production team began to publicly distance the movie from its alien origins and were deliberately vague about the connection between the films, believing it would build audience anticipation for Prometheus. Ridley Scott stated that the keen fan will recognise strands of aliens' DNA, so to speak. But the ideas tackled in the film are unique, large and provocative. Scott and Lindelof confirm that Prometheus takes place in the same universe as the events of the Alien series, but this wouldn't be about connecting itself directly to the first film, going down a different path that could be explored with a new series of movies. For the film's story, it's set in the future of 2089. Archaeologist Elizabeth and her partner Charlie discover a star map deep in a cave in Scotland that matches others from several unconnected ancient cultures dating back thousands of years. They believe this is an invitation from those who created us. The Wayland Corporation funds an expedition aboard the Prometheus. The map sends them to a distant planet codename LV223. It takes the crew four years to reach their destination. While they are asleep in stasis, the android David monitors their voyage while keeping himself busy learning many languages and keeping fit. Once the crew have awoken, Shaw and Holloway inform the crew of their mission, causing a lot of disbelief. Vickers informs them privately if they find the engineers they must not talk to them and do anything without her permission. The Prometheus lands near a large artificial structure. The team go in to explore and unlock a door after seeing an old video recording of the last survivors running to escape from something that is unexplained. Once they enter the room they find stone cylinders, a statue of a humanoid head and the decapitated corpse thought to be an engineer. Shaw recovers its head while David secretly takes a cylinder from the structure while the remaining ones begin leaking a dark liquid. The weather takes a turn for the worse and they need to escape and get back to the ship. Fifield and Milburn get lost and have to stay inside the structure while the weather calms down and stumble across other dead bodies. The crew begin to feel this place is a tomb and this species is extinct. Once back at the Prometheus in the ship's lab, the engineer's DNA is found to match that of humans. With the liquid in the cylinders escaping, Firefield and Milburn begin to witness something moving around. They are not alone. The visual effects for Prometheus will be handled by a number of the big FX houses, the Moving Picture Company, Weta Digital and Rising Sun Pictures. Over 1300 digital effects shots were needed to be completed. If you've seen the documentary for the film called The Furious Gods, it features a lot of the incredible concept art for the early scripts and through the course of pre-production before shooting. The world they created with these designs is largely there on camera. Ridley Scott and his team of artists developed a very strong vision for this production that made it just as unique and interesting as the other films in the long-running Alien franchise. For the scene of the Prometheus descent to the alien moon, the visual effects team referenced NASA imagery, including vortex cloud structures. They also used aerial photography of locations in Iceland and Wadi Rum in Jordan. With a lot of digital manipulation, they created new landscapes from existing photography, and the end results are seamless and look incredible. 
Scott avoided using green screens unless necessary, and would mostly deploy them for the exteriors of the Prometheus from a distance to expand the location. Great efforts were achieved by Ridley Scott and production designer Arthur Max to build a lot of the sets so large the majority of this alien world was done within camera. A key scene involving a large 3D hologram star map, dubbed the Oray, was inspired by the 1766 Joseph Wright painting in which a scientist displays a mechanical planetarium by candlelight. The array was one of the most complex visual effects shots, containing 80 to 100 million polygons and took several weeks to render as a single complete shot and was spectacular to see in 3D. While they filmed this scene, Ridley pumped Dark Side of the Moon over large speakers as Michael acted out his scene as he looked in awe at the star chart. My favourite visual effects moments have to be the escape from the storm and the attack on the alien ship, seeing it explode and crash to the ground and roll across chasing after Shaw and Vickers. It's totally flawless and the scale is spot on and just gobsmacking when I first saw it. It's a major triumph in visual effects and photography. It's always a challenge for filmmakers to create new monsters and the team made a good effort to produce something that is the building blocks of what will become the classic alien we know, but alas they are a bit underwhelming. It's great they went with a lot of practical puppets, but they just weren't scary or creepy. Aside from those creative issues, everything else is just incredible, and being nearly 10 years old, the effects still have that wow factor. The film's score was composed by Mark Streitenfeld, with some additional material written by Harry Gregson Williams. Mark had worked with Ridley Scott on A Good Year, American Gangster, Body of Lies, Robin Hood, and the most recent series produced by Scott, Raised by Wolves. Working with a 90-piece orchestra, it was recorded at Abbey Road Studios in London. Mark started writing ideas after reading the script, even before filming commenced. He did listen to Jerry Goldsmith's score to the 1979 film Alien for inspiration, and loved what Jerry did, but he didn't want to rely on those themes, and as this film focused on creation and discovery, the music would take a different direction, but would make a nod to Jerry's work when Wayland appears as a hologram. Mark first started out creating strange sounds that would be used for the engineers, a breathing sound that represents the heartbeat of this species, though it does sound a bit like when you have a phlegmy chest when you have a cold. The score really helps the movie define this alien world, and the themes of finding our creators in the depths of space. It's optimistic and feels adventurous with its main title, March. It's not haunting or scary at first, but once things begin to move closer to the alien planet and their discovery of this unknown species, it begins to throw in strange sound effects, which is Mark's speciality, with eerie themes to enforce the sense of danger and the unexpected. There are some great tracks with the ghostly recordings of the engineers running away, the escape from the dust cloud as they return to the Prometheus, and when the engineer begins to make his escape. Strangely, some tracks on the soundtrack appear a little familiar to the Alien Resurrection score, not in terms of recycling themes, but of similar musical traits, which wasn't a bad thing as it keeps some musical continuity. The score to Prometheus is not my favourite of the Alien series, its main title March is very strong and doesn't rely on repeating music from the other films. It attempts to do something a lot different, but a number of the tracks rely on strange sounds and cues built to create an unsettling mood and don't lend themselves to easy listening for the most part. It's still a good score, but it's up against some strong competition. The score came out on CD with the film's release and it's still available to purchase. There was also a limited LP version and the score can be downloaded on iTunes, but there hasn't been a complete score released as of yet. Before we get to my thoughts on Prometheus, let's have a quick chat about the sequel. After five years waiting to find out if Shaw and David found the engineer's home planet and would get the answers to many of the questions raised in Prometheus, we got Alien Covenant. A number of fans were left disappointed with the lack of alien action in Prometheus. Ridley Scott felt he went in the wrong direction, focusing on the engineers and attempted to give fans what they wanted with this sequel. What was delivered was still a massive letdown to some fans and angered them with the changes they made. David was now the creator of the Xenomorph. Shaw, who many of us invested in, was killed off by David. The engineers were destroyed in a flashback. We encounter characters acting like idiots. But on the plus side, the film was gorier, far scarier than Prometheus, continued with the strong visuals, which you come to expect from Ridley Scott, and had an incredible soundtrack, easily one of my favorites of 2017. I will discuss the movie in more detail in future. I have warmed to it since it came out, but there are still many issues with it. With the Alien series on hold on what direction they would take, either with a reboot or a sequel to the Ripley timeline, or continuing with David's journey, I personally would like them to finish this new trilogy. 
find out if David turns this new planet into the homeworld of the alien, and perhaps some engineers who are out in space come to seek revenge for what David did. Well that's just my idea of where it could go, as it would be very frustrating if they didn't continue this storyline, as it ultimately makes them pointless and a waste of one's time if they write them off entirely and start again because the film sadly underperformed at the box office. I'm sure many of us were really excited for Prometheus. The marketing was strong with some great trailers, which did reveal a bit too much though, showing us the engineer and seeing the giant croissant-like spaceship explode, but Ridley Scott was in charge again of the series that he kickstarted back in 1979. But after watching it, I'm sure there was a sense of disappointment and perhaps confusion with its overall story and where it sat in the Alien series timeline. As the film has Wayland and even a musical cue from Alien to link them together, it's very clear it's in the same universe, and what we are seeing is the early steps in which Wayland and his company in future would have a greater interest in the alien monster. But the film is not about the xenomorph. The focus is on the engineers who are always referred to as the space jockey. This wasn't about being chased by aliens, this was discovering the origins of life discovering that the human race was created by this alien species, who then for whatever reason wanted to destroy us. As with all films that explore backstories with prequels, things never really match one's own theories and ideas and how things should play out. What we saw in the first Alien was just visual imagery, that was it, so really tough to expand upon only a few nuggets of information. The comic certainly gave it a fair stab, but it could still be labelled fan fiction and not officially canon. This was a major sticking point for Covenant and the changes they made with the origins of the alien creature, with fans shouting they mess with the alien lore. So with Prometheus and its attempts to link the engineers with creating humans and the building blocks of what would become the Xenomorph, I think they did a pretty good job of expanding and explaining this backstory, but it still leaves a number of things unexplained. One thing that always confused me was the mural paintings in the room with a giant engineer head. You can make out the alien, or perhaps it could be the deacon, but this creature doesn't exist yet, because as we see the story unfold, as people are affected by the black liquid, it transforms them, but not into the original alien design, but it does have some visual traits. So to get to the proper xenomorph look would require many changes and mixes with the DNA to get to its truest form. I don't think many were expecting this direction and were hoping to see the alien itself, but as we see the film shifts focus onto the engineers, we still don't learn much about them, aside from their connection to the human race. Their motives and ultimate goal is left unclear. Let's get the good stuff out of the way before I discuss its more problematic areas. As with all Ridley Scott movies, 9 times out of 10 they always look incredible. He has such a fantastic eye to capture mind-blowing visuals to make anything look epic. At his age, he is still one of the strongest visualists in the film industry. As soon as the film starts, it just looks striking. When they finally get to the planet and enter the atmosphere, it's just photorealistic. I can't fault it at all in this area. Ridley Scott is so good at building worlds. The attention to detail that goes into the Prometheus spaceship, the alien planet, and just the use of technology has a believable practical function. It still has a bit of the retrofitted world of the 1979 film, but does look a bit too clean and again with prequels appearing to have more advanced tech. You could argue the Nostromo was an older piece of equipment, but often the case prequels often look more advanced messing with continuity. One of the biggest issues that arose with reviews and many discussions with fans of the Alien series was the film's characters. First we have too many, so it becomes a juggling act to give them enough screen time. They attempt to introduce most of the cast early on, feeling very reminiscent of Alien vs Predator, but you soon forget their names and what their role is on this mission. They soon become background characters who get killed off or just disappear entirely. A similar situation to Alien 3 which had loads of inmates you lose track of. The main focus is Shaw, Holloway, David, Vickers and you could say Yannick. You have these supporting characters like Fifield, Milburn and Ford. Whalen pops up with his own staff who have done a great job of hiding from the other crew, but what it boils down to is that the majority of them are frustrating or irritating characters who you struggle to invest in or care about thanks to their bland and forgettable dialogue. You have individuals who appear to like any training and make rookie mistakes. I suppose with this being a privately funded trip by Wayland, he or Shaw have chosen people based on their skill set, but there appears to be no training to deal with being on a hostile planet. Everyone is just so carelessly walking around. Firefield has the right attitude and is totally paranoid and wants to get back to the ship. Holloway I found to be an unlikable character. Logan is a good actor and superb in Upgrade, but in Prometheus he's just a bit of a prick. 
He is clearly written to be this way, he is rude to David, doesn't follow the rules and has a bloated ego, doesn't appreciate their discovery and he gets killed off. I was like, good. <laughs> The film's strength and focus is definitely with Shaw and David. They are the ones Ridley Scott wants you to care about, and you do. Shaw turns from this naive woman with the goal of searching for our creators, with a strong faith in God, transforms into a person with a mission to save the planet Earth, and no longer cares about these engineers, and just wants to know the answer to why they wanted to kill us. What did we do wrong? She has elements of Ellen Ripley but it doesn't feel like a copy and paste of her character. She's very much her own person. David just draws you in very early on due to Fassbender's stellar performance. The way he delivers his words, he's mysterious and doesn't reveal his motives. He comes across as someone who is there to help you, but behind his eyes there is something dark there and you can't fully trust him. There's a great ambiguity to him. Outside of the cast of characters being a problem, another issue I felt was when the crew enter the engineer's facility. Instead of the crew doing any proper investigating, we are shown these recorded messages that are triggered by David, showing us the last moments of the engineers as they attempt to flee. With two of them running into the room, the team enter and have apparently vanished. David is later shown how to operate the spacecraft, in particular using a flute, which is a bit bizarre via these messages, which he didn't activate aside from making the chair move. I felt it was a bit of a cop-out to throw in what happened or how to do things without a proper explanation. It just seemed a bit of a lazy way to get from point A to point B, having these messages just be essentially exposition dumps to get the story moving forward. With its 15 rating, or say R rating, it does give the filmmakers a chance to push the gore and horror, but the film is very light on the scares, with it only having a few creepy scenes such as Firefield sitting outside the ship with his body bent over. The clear highlight is Shaw with her attempts to get the alien out of her stomach, which is a great scene and clearly a take on the original film with the chestburster sequence. Once Shaw removes the alien, in reality she won't be able to do any running around, <laughs> as her core stomach muscles have been torn, but it does make you wince every time you see her bash it or someone hits her in the stomach, you do feel her pain. The Alien series were known for being scary, sometimes they would lean on the gory side like Alien Resurrection. What was clear is that these movies were made for adults, not to entertain kids and younger teenagers. The AVP series saw this shift to appeal to younger viewers, which didn't go down too well with the fans. Prometheus, despite having a 15 rating, it was a pretty tame 15 for modern standards. Alien Covenant got the same rating and was far more graphic, with it trying to meet the expectations of the franchise. Prometheus doesn't really deliver on the horror as it heads in a different direction, but the filmmakers should have at least expected what the fans of this franchise would want to see, and sadly as a whole film it doesn't meet those expectations. Despite my reservations with this film, and if we'll ever see a finale to this new storyline in the Alien universe, I still enjoyed large chunks of it. For a film that does annoy me in parts, I've seen it quite a few times and still get some fun out of it. I've spoken to many people who hate this film but they have admitted to watching it loads of times, so there is something about it that draws them back to it to sit through it again. It may not be the glorious return we were expecting from Ridley Scott. As they say in particular film critics like Mark Commode, Ridley is only ever as good as the script. He can make the film look stunning, but if the script doesn't deliver, it doesn't matter how amazing it looks. It's interesting seeing the early building blocks for the film with John Spate's original ideas. It sounded like the perfect prequel, but there must have been something in it that didn't make it work as a whole piece, hence the rewrites. But maybe Ridley Scott just became too obsessed with the origins of mankind and linking them with the engineers perhaps. You got to give them credit for doing something original with the series. As we saw with the sequels, it becomes a similar scenario of trying to escape from one alien or many. If you look at fan fiction, comics and even video games, they mainly focus around the marines and endless amounts of pulse rifle action. After a while it just becomes a bit stale and repetitive, so they made a valiant effort to do something different that sadly didn't fire on all cylinders. It's an extremely well made film, with mind blowing detail to the production and costume design, with standout performances from Michael Fassbender and Numi Rapace, and the story has a lot of ambition. The film does a serviceable job of expanding the alien universe for the most part, but it raises too many questions and didn't meet my expectations of the building blocks of the alien creature. And despite it showing us the engineers, we don't really learn much about them, and I was left a bit empty handed by the end. You've been asleep. Here on the ship all this time, 
Why? Well, I only have a few days of life left in me, and I didn't want to waste them until I was sure that you could deliver what you promised. To meet my maker. Haven't you told him they're all gone? But they're not all gone, Dr. Shaw. One of them is still alive. We're on our way to see him now. You convinced me that if these things made us, then surely they could save us. They'll save me anyway. Save you from what? Death, of course. And we're so close to answering the most meaningful questions ever asked by mankind. How can you leave without knowing what they are? Speak to him, David. Tell him we came. Ask him what's in his cargo. It killed his people. Sure. Enough. she talking about? Oh, yeah, it is. You have to stop it. If you don't stop it, there won't be any home to go back to. It's, it's carrying death. It's headed for us. This is David. He's coming for you. 